we'll start with introductions now. I see we have uh, about 20 participants at the moment. Um, so just to say, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the third EPRC webinar of the year. Uh, some of you are, might already know me, but uh, I'm Liliana Fonseca. I'm a research associate at the European Policy Research Center. And we are delighted, as always, to be able to welcome you all from a bit all over the world today. I already have quite a few international uh, people here. Um, and of course, for future webinars as well, I hope you'll join us. Today, we welcome presenter Professor Sebastian Bourdin from EM Normandy uh, Business School. He will discuss uh, on between re-renationalization re and hyper-Lisbonization, a long goodbye to the EU cohesion policy original goals. And he'll be joined by uh, Alessandra de Renzis from the Gran Sasso Science Institute and Frances Francesco Molica from the European Commission's Joint Research Center. I hope I didn't butcher any of those names, sorry if I did. <laughs> the presentation will last about 30 minutes followed by discussion. And in the remaining time, we will open the floor for questions and comments from the audience. If you would like to make an intervention, intervention, just use the Zoom raise a hand function that you will see at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, or feel free to also use the chat function. And after the presentation, we will address these in the Q&A section. Uh, just before introducing our speaker as well, I would just like to inform you that this meeting is being recorded, which means that you and your colleagues have the opportunity to follow the meeting at a later stage. Uh, this recording will then be made available uh, by email and on our YouTube channel. Uh, and we would also like to encourage you, of course, to use Twitter to share your thoughts on the webinar. It's always good to get some more engagement. Uh, so let me present our speaker today. Sebastian Bourdin is now a regular at EPRC seminars, which we are very fortunate for. He is <laughs> professor in economic geography at the Normandy Business School, as I mentioned. He holds a PhD in geography and an accreditation to supervise research. He specializes in the study of the European Union and issues related to cohesion policy, territorial development, public policies evaluation, and ecological transition. In his research, he uniquely combines quantitative methods such as spatial econometrics, statistics and modeling, and qualitative methods to provide a more in-depth perspective on some of his favorite topics. Um, Sebastian Bourdin has also led several notable research projects on current topics, such as the energy transition and circular economy. And uh, I would thus give the floor to Sebastian. Please uh, go ahead, I think. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I'm doing... Yes, do you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Uh, yes. Okay, so um, um, so for this uh, presentation, uh, the idea is that first to present the, the context of uh, this uh, this paper. Uh, and then we'll uh, present the research question and the objectives of of this uh, of this communication. Um, and then we'll provide you some uh, some insights about what we are calling the hyper Lisbonization and also the re renationalization of cohesion policy. And then we will open the discussion. Uh, uh, to to go further on these two uh, important topics. Uh, and design some avenues for future research. Uh, so, first of all, uh, um, we thought that it was very important to come back uh, on uh, two important uh, reports that has been published recently. The first one, um, which is uh, a report that has been coordinated by Andre, Andres Rodriguez Pose about the future of uh, uh, the cohesion policy. And uh, the, the last week, the uh, European Commission published uh, the NINT report on economic, social, and territorial cohesion. And uh, I think that it was, we think that it was very important to uh, uh, look at the details of these two reports because they are very insightful. And from this perspective, what these reports are saying is that first, um over the uh, last uh, let's say now um, 30 years um 
the European Union has invested uh, like a lot of money, uh, 1,000 billion of uh, euros between 1989 reform and 2023. Uh, so it's a lot of investment. Uh, and just for the uh, um, period 2127, uh, it's like uh, almost 400 billion of euros uh, that are uh, dedicated to the cohesion policy, which uh, make this uh, policy the main investment policy uh, in Europe. And if we look at the uh, results of this cohesion policy, uh, um, Regarding the past, uh, the past year, what we can say is that first, uh, the EU cohesion policy is a fundamental driver of social and economic progress, and we know uh, a lot of good examples. And the report uh, produced by the uh, by uh, the group of experts of uh, Rodriguez, uh, Andres Rodriguez Posé. Uh, is very uh, enlightened uh, for, for, for this perspective. Then uh, what we can also say is that this cohesion policy lifted many Europeans uh, out of poverty. Uh, and again, we have a lot of examples. Let's think, for example, uh, for a, a UDET uh, in Romania, the UDET of Yash, uh, which was... Uh, uh, one of the poorest UDET uh, when uh, Romania entered into uh, integrated the, the European Union. And now uh, this uh, uh, UDET is developing uh, very fast uh, thanks to uh, the European Union uh, integration and the cohesion uh, policy funds. And we have observed, and there are many papers on this topic about the catching up of uh, the regions especially um, uh, by the uh, Central and Eastern European countries. And finally, it's a policy that has been replicated across the world, which, which means that uh, it's an important policy that is effective in a way that uh, it, it, this type of policies are now used uh, uh, in different countries in the world to be replicated. Um, and uh, for this reason, cohesion policy, it's, a, it's an important uh, investment policy. Um, and it has been demonstrated many times by the, the researchers. And if you look at this, uh, this table, um, the EU po population living in less developed countries has uh, dramatically uh, uh, decreased from the year 2000 to 2023. Uh, and it's the same if you look at the EU population uh, living in less developed regions. Again, uh, we can say that, uh, let's say, cohesion policy uh, uh, did a good job in a certain way, let's say. Uh, but in the same time, uh, what we can also say is that there is a problem of competitiveness in, in Europe. And there are many maps that have been produced recently uh, and incorporated in the last uh, cohesion poly the, the cohesion uh, report of the European Commission. And uh, there is clearly a problem of competitiveness. The EU economy was 25% of the world economy in 1991. And by 2022, it was 70%, which means that our position as a leading uh, region of the world in terms of competitiveness um, is uh, is decreasing. Uh, secondly, uh, 60 million EU citizens live in regions with GDP per capita lower than in, in 2000, which means that even if we observed uh, a convergence of the regions, um, uh, there are still a lot of uh, regional uh, inequalities and people that are left behind. And uh, if you also uh, look at the uh, different maps, we can see that 75 uh, regions uh, are with near uh, zero growth, which means that, again, this is a, a, an important aspect that we need to tackle. Uh, um, and of course, this lack of uh, growth can generate uh, discontent and there is a, a, a new literature on this uh, topic uh, that, uh, that is driven by Andres Rodriguez-Pose that is uh, also highlighting how the development traps in Europe 
are generating um, uh, this content. Uh, and uh, the last uh, figure is that one third of the EU population, population in places uh, that have slowly fallen behind. And we have a lot of development traps, including in well-developed countries such as France, for example, which is a, a, a very good uh, example. And of course, in this type of regions, um, th there is a, a big issue and we need to tackle uh, this type of uh, issues uh, with uh, by investing in this region rather than uh, living behind this, uh, these regions. Uh, there is also a problem of polarization and downgrading. Uh, the best example, of course, is um, the, uh, uh, the, the French regions uh, and a Spanish region, but French regions are a very good example because uh, even in several regions in, let's say, wealthy countries, uh, they are below the average of the EU GDP per capita. And the map of the uh, level of development in Europe is changing dramatically, uh, and it has changed uh, very quickly. And now we have uh, we have uh, uh, problems of economic growth that is an increasingly problem. Uh, and this economic growth, why, why, why it is a problem? Because this economic growth is increasingly concentrated in a few large urban areas. And again, if you look at this, uh, this map, you can see uh, uh, obviously that uh, if you are a capital region, you are concentrating a lot of uh, the, the wealth in your country uh, and you are, um, uh, and the, the other regions are uh, in somehow in, in most of the countries lagging behind. Uh, another important context uh, to uh, um, um, design our, our research was to uh, uh, think about the global landscape in which the cohesion policy uh, has to, uh, let's say, uh, um, let's say, drive. Um, the first one is the question of climate change. This is an urgent uh, question. A lot of papers have been published uh, recently in regional science on the impact of climate change on regional inequalities. Second is the question of deglobalization and the disruption of global value chains. With the COVID-19, uh, the global value chains uh, have been uh, dramatically uh, redesigned. And of course, this deglobalization can have consequences for some regions. And we can ob already observe that there are uh, uh, winning regions and let's say losing region. Uh, with the Ukrainian war and the geopolitical fragmentation around the world, uh, there is a, a, a threat uh, regarding uh, these uh, geostrategic and geopolitical issues. And of course, uh, there are uh, new technologies such as the uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the need to uh, adapt our uh, uh, production uh, uh, means to, toward a more uh, automation economy and a robotization economy. And finally, uh, we are experiencing currently an inflation and a debt crisis. And all in all, if you look at this turbulent global landscape, it asks uh, quick answers, but at the same time, we really need to think uh, in a long-term perspective rather than uh, thinking in, in a short-term perspective. And of course, we, we will, we will uh, be demonstrating that um, we are observing uh, more and more uh, short-term strategies rather than long-term strategies that will be able to tackle this turbulent uh, global landscape. Uh, Francesco, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, by the way, I have a slight issue with uh, my laptop in that I cannot see your presentation, so maybe we could switch. I can uh, share my uh, yep. screen. Sorry yes. for this uh, little yes. disruption, but... Uh, no worries. Again, um, uh, it's not my fault. Perfect. Do you see the screen now? Yes, perfect. Okay, excellent. 
So let's go to the uh, uh, next slide after this uh, very comprehensive uh, introduction uh, uh, contextualization uh, uh, by Sebastian before delving into the uh, two main uh, theoretical arguments of uh, our uh, paper. It's also good uh, to uh, look at the origins of cohesion policy because this is an important uh, background then for uh, our uh, um, arguments. Um, so cohesion policy, at least uh, the 1988 uh, reform was uh, uh, introduced, adopted uh, in order to, uh, with the view to reconcile uh, two apparently uh, contradictory objectives uh, that were already enshrined in the treaties. Uh, on the one hand, uh, social justice and territorial equity, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, um, completion and and deepening of, of the single market. On the other hand, the, uh, the, uh, indeed, the uh, objective of uh, uh, promoting uh, 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 market-related uh, 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 policies, economic freedoms, market freedoms, and so on and so forth. So the policy, as you all know, was introduced basically to remedy, to correct, to mitigate the unintended consequences of a certain number of market-led policies of, of the then community. Um, and um, uh, clearly, whether the initial uh, objective of the policy was, and the scope of the policy initially was quite um, narrow in that uh, the policy focused on lagging areas, uh, on the regional development of lagging areas or areas uh, which uh, had been facing by then um, prospects of the industrialization or a, or a quite significant process of the industrialization. Already since the 90s, uh, the uh, scope of the, polity, of the policy uh, started shifting and expanding, uh, including uh, uh, alongside the, uh, the uh, uh, main objective of uh, promoting territorial convergence and more broader objective of uh, competitiveness. Um, in order to make sure that uh, uh, the regions, uh, not only the lagging regions, but European regions in general, uh, uh, could be able to seize the opportunities coming from uh, a more globalized uh, uh, world or a, or a more uh, knowledge-based uh, and post-industrial economy. And there too, the policy also, the thematic scope of the policy started shifting a little bit from focusing on infrastructures and manufacturing clusters, for instance, to financing more R&I uh, activities and more indeed uh, 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 knowledge-based economic activities. Uh, so the scope of the, polity, of the policy, geographically speaking, thematically speaking, uh, the mission of the policy to expanding a little bit. And we ended up with basically two objectives, convergence alongside uh, uh, competitiveness. And already in the early 2000s, in the wake of the introduction of the Lisbon, of the Lisbon Agenda, and we will come to that in, in a minute, some scholars started at least questioning whether, started asking the question, wondering, sorry, whether these two, the policy could pursue these two objectives and maximize the, these two objectives in a, in a smooth way without having to... Uh, deal with uh, uh, trade-offs uh, uh, between between the two, and so started. Uh, they started wondering whether these two objectives could be uh, reconciled uh, within the policy without apparent frictions. Now, here comes uh, finally the uh, research questions of our uh, of uh, our paper and hypothesis uh, objectives. Uh, we, we, of course, our paper focuses on the uh, past uh, four or five years, and uh, it uh, asks whether the uh, successive uh, uh, shocks uh, that we've been going through uh, since COVID-19 have affected uh, both two important dimensions of the policy, that is uh, the objectives of the policy and the uh, decision uh, uh, making. And our research hypothesis basically is essentially is that uh, it, the answer to this question is yes, and 
uh, the answer is, uh, is uh, indeed that uh, uh, these uh, two dimensions have been affected by reviving two trends that have been already observed in the past in regards to the policy, that is the so-called Lisbonization and the renationalization of uh, a cohesion policy. So coming to Lisbonization, what is Lisbonization? Well, clearly Lisbonization, uh, the uh, concept of Lisbonization stems from uh, the, uh, the uh, Lisbon strategy. As you know, in uh, the 2000, the uh, leaders of the uh, uh, European Union gathered in uh, Lisbon and they adopted a long-term overarching strategic document setting a certain number of long-term indeed goals, objectives uh, for the European Union by 2010 um, with the uh, pledge, the overall overarching pledge to turn the continent into a leading uh, knowledge-based uh, economy in uh, 10 years uh, time. Now, cohesion policy at the time well, even if, uh, sorry, the direct link between uh, co cohesion policy and the Lisbon strategy was established uh, in 2007, already in the 2000 and 2006 uh, period of the policy, clearly some objectives of the policy are, uh, I'm, 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 I must say, um, um, sort of aligned with the spirit of the, uh, Lisbon, uh, of the Lisbon strategy. But a clear link was established in 2007 and 2013. At the time, there was an effort, a uh, political uh, commitment to relaunch the quite faltering at the time Lisbon strategy. And this was done also by explicitly linking cohesion policy, the framework of cohesion policy, to the objectives of the uh, Lisbon strategy. Now, this link was then further reinforced in the 2014-2020 period of cohesion policy, where the thematic structure of, the, of cohesion policy was clearly uh, organized around the main priorities of the Agenda Europa 2020, which was the continuation the, uh, uh, of the successor uh, of the uh, Lisbon strategy. So what do we mean by uh, Lisbonization of cohesion policy based on existing uh, literature and how it was concept conceptualized at the time uh, in, in literature? So first, uh, cohesion policy priorities are more aligned uh, with the EU main uh, uh, goals that are indeed then, uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, established, include, set out uh, by these two overarching uh, strategic uh, strategies, strategic frameworks, the Lisbon strategy first and then uh, Gender Europa 2020. This also implies within the policy a stronger coordination, of course, for the member states in that they have an important role in transposing, translating uh, EU priorities into national uh, policies, which might result also in more centralization in terms of management of the funds. And then also the, the third dimension mention is uh, the introduction of earmarking mechanisms, uh, funding earmarking mechanisms within the policy in order to indeed uh, operationalize, implement this alignment, uh, uh, this consistency, uh, co coherence between uh, the uh, overall uh, uh, EU priorities and uh, the uh, use of uh, cohesion policy funds. There's a fourth element which is not here, which is a more positive one in that, of course, cohesion policy uh, by uh, with through the Lisbonization, clearly also uh, embed a new novel experimental uh, governance a la, um, a la Zeitlin. Uh, uh, and this is also uh, in, uh, something that it is clearly uh, highlighted uh, in uh, this uh, uh, in a paper from 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 Carlos Mendez from uh, 2011. Now, what are the consequences? The consequences are that the objectives of the policy. Uh, start uh, expanding, they keep expanding at the expense or overshadowing uh, the uh, cohesion policy primary goals, initial goals, when the policy had a much more defined and narrower uh, uh, focus, because in order to address a set of broader policy at EU level, this is, this is the, 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 the result, to the point that there uh, starts to be a some confusion about what are the uh, goals of the policy. There's a very uh, well-known paper of Ian Begg on this. And the economic rationale of the policy, the competitiveness objective, of course, uh, um, uh, becomes more and more prominent 
partially at the expense at the expense to the detriment of the uh, territorial and social uh, and social focus then there's a stronger coordination role uh, from member states and uh, cohesion policy is, uh, also uh, is seen more and more as uh, a uh, funding pot to finance different and many more objectives, some of which are not clearly aligned with the um, um, mission of, of the policy. Now, fast forward to today, enter the COVID-19 crisis, enter the energy crisis, enter the geopolitical tensions resulting from the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, uh, enter the uh, increasing technological uh, competition uh, with uh, China and the US. Uh, uh, clearly, cohesion policy is affected uh, by uh, all of this. We have entered uh, a polycrisis of permacrisis age where shocks happens, happen, occur, occur uh, more frequently, uh, multiple shocks at the same time. Uh, the EU budget uh, uh, as a structure which was originally designed in 1988, so it is clearly not well suited for this uh, uh, new uh, historical period we, uh, in which we have uh, enter, entered, sorry, in that it is extremely rigid and also two-thirds of the EU budget is pre-allocated to member states, so uh, the uh, margin, uh, the room for maneuver is very uh, narrow and uh, what's left for managing unforeseen or addressing unforeseen events and accommodating new, new priorities over time is, uh, is not much. Mm? Um, and indeed, we have the emergence of uh, new, uh, new uh, priorities. So how uh, the European Union could go about that since COVID? Basically by turning to cohesion policy, because cohesion policy uh, represents, accounts after all, for one third of the EU budget. And in 2020, when the COVID-19 um, uh, happened when the, when, when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, hit uh, the, the continent, uh, most of the uh, cohesion policy funds uh, had not been spent already. So this was it was uh, logical to uh, turn to cohesion policy also because the, the instruments of cohesion policy, the programs and everything were already in place. So this could allow using uh, cohesion policy funds uh, for addressing the crisis or for addressing uh, these new priorities more easily. So here we come to the hyperlasbonization, the introduction of more flexibility within the policy in order to accommodate these new priorities that have been emerging in the past years, to um, uh, address the effect of uh, the multiple shocks that uh, we have uh, uh, faced, uh, is clearly producing, in our opinion, and this is one of the main thesis of the uh, paper, a shift from a state of, of Lisboniz Lisbonization, so, sorry, to a state of hyperlasbonization. How we conceptualize hyperlasbonization? Hyperlasbonization, in our opinion, is the fact that uh, the cohesion policy is not just aligned with long-term objectives of the EU, but it is, it is also increasingly serving the short-term uh, priorities and objectives uh, of, of the EU. So this flexibility, that further, further flexibility that, been in, that has been introduced in the policy is also there to make sure that the policy can accommodate short-term uh, priorities. There is a further expansion of cohesion policy objectives uh, or, or priorities. So here this is in continuity with an existing trend. Also because the policy is not anymore anchored in a single strategic framework because after uh, the uh, agenda Europa 2020, uh, uh, there was... Uh, uh, let's say, um, we, we, from after the Agenda Europa 2020, we haven't had, we haven't established another uh, strategic uh, framework, a single one at least. There are some important frameworks. There's the, U, the EU Green Deal, of course, there's the pillar of, uh, of uh, social rights, but we do not have, we are lacking a, a strategic framework, an overarching strategic framework or vision at, at, at EU level. Um, and, of course, uh, the fact that the policy needs to be more flexible and more responsive strengthens the role of member states vis-à-vis -vis the Commission, because member states are, giving, are given sorry, more leeway to uh, use the funds in a more flexible way, which means that the um, powers of the Commission vis-à-vis -vis the, the, the member states are 
diminished. And going to, 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 the last, uh, to the last point, it's clear that in order to accommodate the implementation of EU priorities and more EU priorities, there's a further shift from a specially driven logic to a sectoral-based logic. So um, the sectoral ba a sectoral-based logic is clearly prevailing on the uh, previous specially driven uh, one. So here we have a little table showing the differences between the Lisbonization and hyper-Lisbonization. Uh, this could be uh, then, so it's, a, it's a basically, it summarizes. But then let's go to the second argument uh, of the thesis. So the first trend is indeed uh, the hyper-Lisbonization. The second one is what we call the re-renationalization. So of course, the renationalization of cohesion policy was a, uh, uh, would say, a theory that uh, strength uh, that uh, was pretty much discussed uh, uh, in uh, political science, you studies, uh, literature uh, in the 90s or still in the early, uh, in the early 2000s, according to which member states were acquiring uh, gradually in the context of the policy more powers, especially vis-a-vis -vis the European Commission. Now, this debate around whether the policy uh, has uh, renationalized or not uh, has been sort of fading uh, in, in, the past, in the past years. Um, some scholars, uh, by the way, have also highlighted that uh, the renationalization thesis was a bit overstating uh, the uh, powers uh, assigned uh, uh, to uh, the uh, member states. Uh, Mendez uh, Buckler, in particular, in a, in a paper from uh, uh, 2007, Who Governs Coalition Policy, they uh, show that uh, if you look at the concrete uh, dynamics uh, uh, of the relationship between member states and the commission, after all, the power of member states uh, is not uh, so uh, uh, is not so uh, significant that the commission has still exerts uh, still uh, uh, quite some control over the decision of uh, of member states. I'm oversimplifying uh, here the uh, the uh, findings of, of of this paper, and also there are some scholars that. Uh, have rightfully so, in my opinion, posited that, posited that the renationalization process has been somehow reversed because there have been a number of uh, novelties in the policy uh, that have uh, um, sort of uh, in, in introduce more caveat, more constraints uh, in what the member states uh, uh, could, uh, could do. Uh, think of the thematic concentration, uh, think of uh, the, um, uh, the uh, code of contact code of conduct on partnership, uh, uh, think of the link with the European semester, and so on and so forth. Now, what was about the renationalization thesis? Many features, many, uh, many arguments. Uh, I have, uh, we have listed in our, uh, um, in our presentation here three. First, according to the proponents of the renationalization thesis, uh, uh, member states had quite some discretion in the designation of, are, of areas eligible for funding. This was before the 2007 uh, period when still uh, areas uh, uh, outside the objective one uh, uh, could be uh, uh, chosen, uh, could be designated by member states according to, of course, some criteria set by the Commission. Uh, the increasing simplification also, coupled with diminished powers on the side of the Commission, also left clearly more, more discretion uh, to uh, member states as to how manage the funds, and that was also the case um, for the implementation of the partnership ag ag agreement and the partnership principle before the code of contact was introduced in the 2014 period. Now, why, why with the recent crisis we are now sliding back to a state of renationalization uh, after uh, uh, the uh, emphasis on multi-level governance on place-based uh, 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 in during the 2014 uh, 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 period uh, with the 2014 uh, uh, reform? Again, because the flexibility that was uh, 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 given uh, to uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, member states uh, uh, in order to address new priorities, in order to address the effects of the crisis uh, within, uh, within the policy, has uh, had the unintended 
consequence to strengthen uh, their uh, to reinforce uh, their powers and to tilt uh, therefore the decision making of the policy toward uh, the uh, member uh, the member states here in our paper we look uh, at two dimensions uh, uh, through which uh, we try to uh, demonstrate that uh, indeed there's a shift toward more nationalization uh, the two dimensions are the spatial concentration of the funds and the thematic concentration of the funds. So in regards to the spatial concentration of the funds, uh, member states, uh, since the crisis, are uh, left now, are given more discretion in uh, moving funds and in transferring funds from category, across categories of regions. Of course, uh, uh, this possibility is capped, uh, but still, so it is, uh, there, there are some limitations to what member states can do, but still, it is a clear change from the previous principle of non-transferability of funds across categories of regions or little transferability, only 1% could have been uh, transferred in the past. The introduction of the Just Transition Fund is also interesting. Sorry, here there's a typo. I wrote, uh, we wrote uh, JTC instead of JTF. In that, for the first time, member states uh, regain the possibility only under the Just Transition Fund, which is a relatively small fund vis-a-vis -vis the other funds of the cohesion policy. But I would say member states regain the possibility to designate eligible areas. So they decide which areas are eligible and which not, although this is based on a non-binding list uh, prepared by the, by the European Commission. Uh, and of course, we are facing an uh, increasing, uh, this is not something that uh, uh, is from yesterday, yeah, but uh, in, over the years, we've been uh, seeing an increasing politicization of the MFF negotiations through which member states they they are now um, more and more negotiating exceptions uh, uh, or adjustments to the Berlin formula, so to the allocation formula of the cohesion policy in order to favor specific categories, specific groups of regions or even specific regions uh, within, uh, within their country, so which means that they have even more power in the special concentration of funds. Regarding the thematic concentration of funds, and we are wrapping up here, clearly that uh, we have uh, now more flexibility in terms of uh, reprogramming the resources. Uh, so there's a higher discretion uh, in how the resources can be moved from a priority to another, uh, which strengthens, of course, the powers of member states, in this case also managing authorities vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis, uh, the, 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 the commission. Um, and also uh, uh, the fact that the thematic concentration can be done at national level uh, is, uh, is also something that uh, uh, clearly um, give more power, um, gives more power to member states, uh, as, is, as it is the case for the transfer of resources between funds. Now member states have more flexibility in moving resources from a fund uh, of, uh, of another, meaning from ERDF uh, to, uh, into ESF. So, all of these changes are clearly a, have a strong rationale. The flexibility is important, let me say this, so, uh, because uh, the, uh, we are facing a much more uh, um, volatile uh, context. So managing authorities have to uh, be uh, able to uh, make uh, uh, a more flexible use of the funds. So this is the rationale behind all of these, uh, all of these measures, which made perfectly sense uh, to me. And I fully subscribe to this, uh, uh, to this, uh, to this. But uh, uh, of course, this, uh, the, all of this has the unintended consequences in that uh, uh, member states, the, 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 in the decision making of the policy, member states have acquired or will acquire uh, more, uh, more uh, powers at, dispense, at the expense of the other two important actor agents uh, within the decision making of the policy, that is the commission and the local and regional authorities. So here we have a basic summary of what I was saying. We have a shift towards centralization due to recent efforts to increase flexibility in the use of cohesion policy. Uh, this was done through a certain number of uh, legislative measures, which I insist uh, are perfectly sensical, make, uh, make a lot of sense, uh, uh, should have been done, but uh, uh, are also uh, having this unintended uh, consequence. And uh, there's a risk for local authorities, indeed, uh, to um, um, uh, be less involved in the decisions as to the design and implementation or management 
of uh, the uh, of uh, the uh, funds uh, and the risk of course also that the territorial dimensions and bottom up dyna dynamics which are indeed uh, critical pillars uh, uh, critical mainstays uh, of of the policy um, are uh, diluted so maybe i can uh, maybe uh, sebastian can yes ju yes. just to wrap up very, very quickly um, first, uh, as we mentioned in the introduction, the uh, mega trends now, uh, we are facing many challenges. And uh, of course, in the design of the future cohesion policy, uh, there will be an urgent need to uh, address as well the challenges, the mega trends, but also to keep in mind that uh, we really need to uh, uh, clarify uh, what is the objective uh, of designing uh, territorial development that is sustainable, which means that probably uh, we need to clarify the equity efficiency trade-offs, uh, uh, which are still at the heart uh, of the policy. Uh, and of course, uh, another important issue is that we need to push for more national coordination and this push for national national coordination should not sacrifice the role of local authorities because uh, the local authorities are uh, probably uh, the, the 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 best institution uh, to get uh, let's say an overview of the local resources uh, of the uh, local uh, strategies that need to be designed uh, in order to generate uh, growth as well as um, to uh, address the mega trends that we are facing. Uh, and finally, uh, it's the last slide. We identify uh, um, different, uh, let's say, avenues for future research. Can you move to the last slide? And for for the <laughs> I'm doing my best. Yeah, but yeah, no, no worries. Be, uh, but it's okay. so, there, there you go. Yeah, we identified we identified uh, four main avenues for future uh, research on this topic. Uh, first, um, with Alessandra and Francesco, we uh, were thinking about analyzing how this hyper Lisbonization and the renationalization. Uh, is uh, appearing in different parts of the uh, Europe. So we definitely need to uh, have more uh, uh, case studies uh, and to compare these case studies to uh, highlight um, the extent to which this hyper-Lisbonization and renationalization uh, has consequences at the local level and how local authorities are dealing with these two, uh, these two trends. Uh, second, another important aspect is that in uh, the context of megatrends, uh, of course, the question of the allocation of cohesion policy funds are uh, very important. And we uh, ob obviously need to assess the impact on digital and green transitions uh, in various regions. There are some new papers that are that have been published recently in regional science on this topic, but it's, let's say, a new topic, and we really need to uh, uh, investigate this and to see how the cohesion policy funds uh, can, uh, um, uh, can uh, let's say, reduce the inequalities in terms of digital and green transition. Uh, another important uh, uh, avenue of research uh, was uh, is to analyze the impact of policy shifts. Of course, uh, Francesco uh, already uh, talked about it, and uh, Alessandra uh, has already uh, started to uh, uh, analyze in the case of uh, the Italian regions that uh, there are uh, losers and winners uh, of this uh, national recovery and resilient plans. And of course, there is a need uh, to analyze what is the spatial distribution of this type of funds. Uh, and how this uh, uh, unequal spatial distribution, the spatial heterogeneity of these of these funds, uh, have consequences locally. And and finally, 
we talked about the renationalization and the uh, hyper lisbonization uh, an important uh, aspect is how to measure it uh, so there is a big challenge for the regional scientists to define how to measure it and to assess the potential uh, when we're, when we've got the, the the right measures to assess the potential uh, for for new territorial imbalances um due to this renationalization and the hyper uh, lisbonization and that's all <laughs> thank you very much for thank your you. presentation <laughs> um i would then open the floor for questions does anyone have um any inputs that they want to to make we have the three co-authors here <laughs> which we're quite lucky to. <laughs> uh, well, if if there is no uh, direct question, um, one question for 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 you would be um, because you are expert of the cohesion policy. Uh, do you agree with our uh, two main theoretical uh, arguments, or do you think that it's uh, not at all a, a good one or no, just to, to get your feedback about what you think about uh, our two main uh, ideas of, of this paper if you don't have direct questions to us just to I get your that's feedback a, that's <laughs> a great way to start yes. uh, this uh, dialogue I saw that you had uh, a few references to uh, some of our papers especially Carlos's papers so I wonder if Carlos <laughs> wants to come in <laughs> uh and give an update um any input on that uh thanks i'm just turning um thanks for bringing me in liliana um yeah i thought uh it's a very convincing argument that that you've made uh that uh there are uh re-centralization pressures in cohesion policy both in terms of the distribution um, of, of funding and in particular the, the thematic uh, orientation of the policy. I guess what, one, one question I had, uh, it struck me that you said that the um, Fran Francesco, that there's a, in the past, there could only be a 1% transfer uh, of funds across uh, from less developed other regions. And I'm wondering, you didn't then quantify what has happened in this period um, in terms of the ability to transfer to to, uh, away from less developed regions to transition or more developed regions. Is, is there any data on this um, and has that increased? Um, because that would be uh, a good indicator. Um, but overall, in, in response to um, uh, to Sebastian, yes, I think it's, it's, it's a convincing argument and rationale um, underpinning your, your, your arguments. Thank you. Do you want to come in on uh, Carlos's question, Francesco or yeah. Sebastian? Yeah. So we would need indeed to uh, quantify um, uh, before the new provisions uh, um, were established uh, uh, the extent to which this. Uh, uh, um, one percent was used, but uh, I'd like to also um, highlight that there's a, an interesting paper from the Conference of Peripheral and Maritime Regions, my former employee, by the way, uh, which uh, looks at uh, how this new provision uh, giving member states the possibility to transfer uh, funds uh, across categories of regions. Uh, uh, has been used in the 21-27 period. Uh, I think I've seen also the author here, one of the authors at least, Julio. So uh, I can I can link this in uh, in uh, in the chat, and it it gives an overview uh, of uh, the extent to which this uh, uh, new provision has been used, and it mm, shows that uh, even if the uptake uh, has not been uh, huge. Uh, it is still a provision that uh, member states have decided, at least some have decided to use, uh, which uh, also points uh, and in my view supports, corroborates uh, uh, one of the main arguments of our paper. Uh, by the way, this uh, um, uh, re the research study from the CPMR is also uh, quoted, uh, cited in, in our paper too. 
thank you. Uh, I see we have two hands up. So Fabian, I think you're first. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot. And uh, I also I found um, the observations very interesting indeed. I do have a, a, a question um, concerning your observations of hyper Lisbonization and regionalization. You started your presentation with presenting the context and all the, the changes that are currently occurring, the context of cohesion policy. Is there a um, causality in any way between your observations of hyper Lisbonization and renationalization and the changes in the context that you've observed? Or is there only a correlation? Um, excuse me if uh, that's yeah, yeah. been pointed uh, out during the presentation and I've well, we, got we, it, but yeah. I don't, well, we don't have the answer because we didn't test yet, but what we uh, are observing now is that this mega trends and this turbulent landscape, uh, it, it will be accelerating. So, so probably that we will suffer from a new crisis um, rapidly uh, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, e local economic impacts uh, and the researchers that are analyzing this crisis are saying that these crises are becoming uh, uh, global. Uh, so, of course, um, we can expect that this acceleration of the future crisis um, will have uh, an effect or an impact. We don't know because we didn't test, but we we, we are thinking that this, uh, these mega trends are, um, let's say, uh, accelerating also the hyper Lisbonization and the renationalization. But we need to test it, of course. And so it, it asks the question on uh, on the on the on, on the on the figures and the measures to uh, really assess uh, and to evaluate what is um, in concrete with concrete figures uh, hyper Lisbonization and renationalization. Okay, thanks. And just a quick follow up: Is the research published yet? It's been published yet? It's under review. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So very soon. <laughs> uh, Wolfgang, uh, you're quite knowledgeable on the topic, so do you want to come in? Oh, you're muted still. Yeah, thanks, Liliana. Uh, I wish I was, I wish I was, uh, because there's always something new to be learned about it, and I just learned a lot. And uh, the presentation by Francesco and Sebastian gave me a lot of ideas. I would like to just make uh, three short remarks and have um, maybe a question um, on the methodology in the end. Um, the first one is, um, it's a critical remark. I would say that Lisbonization is um, a thing from the past, a little bit like renationalization. I remember when there was a reform in the early uh, 2000s, Michel Barnier could use the then commissioner for cohesion policy or regional policy could use renationalization as uh, as um, something that everybody was afraid of, which is possibly no more the case. And what, what I mean by this is that I think the policy has gone through several um, ideational shifts, if you want, and Lisbon was just one of them. I mean, everybody is talking now about the RRF and whether the RRF will be the new uh, delivery model for cohesion policy. So. Uh, cash for reforms is is something that is in the air and so on. So that's the first remark. Maybe Lisbonization is a too short cut out order of different shifts that had have happened over over time. My second remark is uh, beware of the RF. Um, I think it's quite sure with all the announcements, even though the government of the EU to say so will still will only be in place next year and we only see reform proposals. Um, mid next year, um, the RF is what what I hear is, is the supposed model to take many things over, especially the strong link to the European semester. And, and that is that is still a more dramatic shift, I would even say, than the indicators we had um, uh, introduced or Barroso had introduced uh, through Lisbonization, the Lisbon strategy. Um, uh, my last remark is um, on Renationalization or nationalization of cohesion policy. 
think about this. It must not be a necessarily bad thing. If you think that, um, first of all, one must keep in mind that the regionalization of cohesion policy is only affecting a handful of member states. Effectively, if you do the counting of regional programs in the 27 member states, you will see that only five or six account already for 80% of regional programs. So many uh, member states, um, and I would think that with enlargement, we will have a similar issue there, don't know what you mean when you say um, a regional or territorial or locally driven approach, because they don't know regions in, in the administrative um, sense. And if you think, and that is, I think, behind your design, if you think about a good reason to have cohesion policy, one could also um, uh, investigate on the blind eye that despite the treaty provisions, Article 174, that cohesion policy from the EU should um, kind of um, um, build on national approaches to create more inequalities. So if you think about that, then I think um, the 30 years of cohesion policy have not quite managed to put many things into a context uh, that should be there in the end. I take the German example because that's what I know best. We have the lender finance ausgleich, so the interregional equalization system. Nobody ever thought in Germany about to link this to what the EU is doing, now, which is strange because it is basically the same objective, so to iron out regional inequalities. And that is something where I think that uh, also the ninth cohesion report only makes weak, um, um, only provides a weak mentioning of, of this, I would say, gap of linking EU and national cohesion ideas um, closer together. The question I have about the methodology is the following. Um, if you look for whether or not there is a higher level of Lisbonization or hyper Lisbonization, or if you look into uh, renationalization of um, the policy, which are the sources? Do you do discourse analysis, expert interviews, or you know document um, analysis? What is it that you that you do, and how how are you operating um, in this research program that you have um, designed? Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead, Francesco? I know you unmuted. Or, uh... Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Uh, first of all, um, thank you uh, also to, to Wolfgang for his, uh, as usual, very insightful uh, uh, comments. And um, uh, regarding the question, uh, so the paper uh, uh, is uh, currently aimed at launching the debate. Uh, and we have uh, a final section on avenues for future research. So. We are now currently uh, thinking of how to indeed take this to a further level by designing a methodology to, as a, this was uh, uh, this was already said by uh, by Sebastian, in order to explore these two dimensions and measure uh, somehow these two dimensions despite the intrinsic uh, challenges in, in in measuring them. I guess um, uh, one very straightforward way to look at the uh, centralization, which we had, by the way, uh, um, um, thought of, was to observe what's the share of funds that, um, uh, what's the uh, ratio between uh, uh, national and regional funds, at least in those member states where the two typologies of funds can be found. Or in the case of member states, or that there are cases of member states such as Czech Republic or Austria that used to have regional uh, programs and uh, have uh, gone from regional programs to national programs. The problem with this is that, uh, in, for instance, in some of these member states, national programs are then the, partially managed by uh, regions or, or counties as intermediate bodies. So we would need also to uh, factor uh, this uh, factor uh, this uh, in, and of course this is a very simple uh, descriptive analysis that uh, uh, would need to be. We we have Alessandra, by the way, has been working uh, on a more, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, com complex uh, uh, analysis uh, of this using, of course, econometrics. 
uh, and hopefully uh, we will be able to include this uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in another contribution. Uh, uh, as regards the Lisbonization, of course, this, and we have, we have already started working on this, and in particular Alessandra, uh, would require also defining uh, 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 what, uh, uh, what objectives we consider as Lisbonized or not. Uh, if I may say so, so and uh, um, look at uh, how that has been uh, uh, um, throughout the different programming periods, of course, uh, or in the context of the 2014-2020 period, because there's been significant reprogramming of resources uh, in this period. Uh, how uh, the and Alessandra had been, uh, has been already working in this uh, in this direction uh, uh, from what objectives uh, 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 from. Uh, sorry, uh, what, uh, what, uh, how the funds have been reprogramming? Uh, so from, from, uh, from what priorities to which priorities? For instance, one way could be to look at, there, there, have, there have been new priorities that have been included in the policy uh, since COVID. Uh, uh, and a, uh, a way to look at this could be indeed to look at uh, how many funds have been redirected to, uh, to, to the new priorities and also try to understand what are the main drivers, of course, of this in terms of both uh, program-specific and territorial-specific uh, variables uh, indicators. But this is uh, uh, still uh, I'm making up here. But uh, yeah, we have uh, two uh, um, already um, uh, two... Uh, uh, I don't know whether Alessandra would like to come in, by the way, on this. But anyway, uh, we've, we've been working on this uh, under the uh, steer of Alessandra, and, uh, and hopefully we will be able to produce something uh, uh, to corroborate from a statistical point of view uh, uh, our 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 uh, uh, arguments soon. Alessandra, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just one second. I'm sorry if I'm not able, I've been not able to um, be part of the presentation, but unfortunately I have a horrible cold and cough that doesn't allow me to speak for more than 30 seconds before I start coughing. So you please, please, please do accept my apologies. But I left you in the marvelous hands of Sebastian and Francesco. So, um, But indeed what, what Cam was saying was it's important, it's fundamental because I mean, at, at some point we need to get down to data to see what was the shift in which, as Francesco was saying, what thematic objectives, it was just simply a moving level from regional to national, or also regarding what types of um, thematics and uh, topics were actually shifting from one side to the other. We have been looking at these data as well as in some sort of way, also the thematic or um, territorial allocation of funds as what you, um, I think was Fabian saying as well. Um, like basically uh, trying to go deep down inside the history of the cohesion policy, moving from 2000 up to 2020, and, and see how this regions moved um, along the receipt, well, being recipient of funds as well as other economic values and everything. So we are trying to match um, all the data that we have, um, but uh, we, well, we were quite confident of what we, we saw, but we need obviously some more investigation, but uh, um, basically there are uh, regulations that are guiding us in some sort of way, defining what, uh, for example, is shifting thematic objectives, resources from one to another, and could be a hint of what has been happening, basically. <coughs> okay, I manage, I, I reached my limit. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, we've already uh, passed the hour, so I just wanted to thank everyone for staying a little bit uh, later you. than we expected and for all your comments. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Francesco and Al Alessandra for your presentation and all the research work you've been doing uh, and also for the inputs from the audience. Um, just wanted to make a note that our next webinar will be on 8 May with uh, Dr. Alina Dragos, uh, which will speak on a local political leadership and administrative capacity on, for EU structural funds. So you can contact us to register for our mailing list and to keep up to date on these future events. And yeah, we hope to see you all soon. <laughs> Have a good week. Bye -bye. Thank you, Liliana. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.